Um, okay, this, uh, this talk is going to be a lot of fun. There's a lot of old stuff out there that's still running. Uh, the tire shop that I go to, was uh, they, they, their database was in an AS400 until, uh, you know, up, actually it was about a year ago, and then they never migrated any of the data, so they were still running that and another system. Terrible, terrible. So these guys are going to talk about old stuff and problems with old stuff. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. I will say, in, in follow up to that, that is a great, that, that is absolutely the, um, that is absolutely what a great number of the, the people that we meet and talk about uh, and talk to about this kind of stuff um, have to say when we talk about these kind of things. And, and there's a lot of truth in it. This is a, this, this platform, the mainframe platform, specifically we're talking about IBM's System Z, Z series platform, has been around for a long time. So it's absolutely what you would consider legacy. However, but, um, it's very modern, right? The, the, the most recent incarnation of it is as badass as just about, and maybe more so, than anything you can buy in terms of what it does and what it's good at. Um, and so what we're talking about today and the things that Phil and I are going to talk about today are done on the very newest systems, uh, fully updated, fully patched, all this kind of stuff. Um, so we'll go from there. So. Who can relate to this scenario? You wake up in the middle of the night, from a deep sleep, freaking out, a cold sweat. You're thinking to yourself, holy shit, who's doing security research on mainframes? Show of hands. Uh -oh. All right, so both of you. Excellent. Thank you very much for doing that. I appreciate it. I'll pay you afterwards. So this happened to me about 18 months ago. I had occasion in my, uh, in my business life. I'm not, I, I'm not here on, ha on behalf of my employer. This is just a standard disclaimer. Research I'm doing in my free time. Um, but I have occasion in my business life to care about mainframe availability. More so, I have occasion just as a human living in a civilized world, uh, somewhat civilized, in a modern world, uh, to care about mainframes and wanting them to be secure. So 18 months ago, I had this, I had this idea like, well, I wonder who's doing the security research? Who's doing the stuff that you guys do for Linux and Windows and all this kind of stuff? Who's doing it on mainframes? So I start Googling it and I'm looking to see what I can find out about exploit development, mainframes, vulnerability research. You get a couple of companies, but as individuals go, really, they were like, maybe two. And one of them's right here. And so uh, I reached out to Phil, my co speaker here, uh, at the last DEF CON. I said, hey, let me buy you a beer and uh, like to talk about the work you're doing. So uh, he told me all about the work that he was doing and uh, I said, this, this is fantastic stuff. But and I had recently been very much involved in like malware reversing, uh, exploit development, that kind of stuff. I said, well, who's doing this kind of stuff, right? Who's, who's fuzzing the binaries? Who's testing to see if there's buffer overflows? You know, like the, the basic like meat and potatoes at this point of, of uh, security vulnerabilities and that kind of stuff. I said, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that anybody is. And he looked at me and he's like, yeah, you are. I was like, well, I'm not. I mean, I'm not a mainframer. I've, I've worked around mainframes for, for 10 years, but it, you know, it doesn't make me a mainframer anymore than being in my garage makes me a car. So I said, well, I'll give it a shot. So I uh, got a mainframe and uh, I started doing some research on this stuff. And the first thing I did was I went out on Google and I said, what, what's already out there, right? What, what, what vulnerabilities are available? What publicly available proof of concepts are out there for for vulnerabilities, exploit code, shell code, all this kind of stuff. And just by way of example, I went out to from CVEdetails.com. So Windows in the last 10 years has had about 5,000 documented CVEs. No surprise there. Mac OS X about 2,200. ZOS, which is the mainframe, also known as MVS or used to be known as MVS, none. What? That, that can't be right. I know for a fact that there have been security vulnerabilities on the mainframe. Why aren't there publicly documented vulnerabilities, proofs of concepts, shell code, exploits, this kind of stuff? If you ask the, uh, the, the everybody, if you ask the people that have been working this for a while, you'll hear everything from like, well, you can't have, you can't have exploits on the mainframe, you can't have buffer overflows, it doesn't work, it's a secure platform. And it is a secure platform if configured correctly and running code with no bugs in it, which is totally possible, right? Not, not really. So, so why aren't there any, uh, why isn't any of this out there? Well, there's two reasons, uh, in my opinion, there's two reasons of this. 
And the first one, and probably the biggest one, is that IBM has a special relationship with their customers in that they know all of their customers. You can't buy this without working with IBM. You can't get one of these systems without working with them legally. And so they know all of their customers. So by knowing all of their customers, they can release the, uh, they can release security vulnerabilities when they find them and give them to their customers and say, hey, found a security vulnerability. Uh, it's pretty bad, right? They can rank it for you. And uh, here's kind of the area. It's like a, maybe it's program based or network based or something like that. They'll give you like a, a vector light, if you will. And so, and these are for their, their paying customers. They have a secure portal where they give them this information. And then the customer can decide if they want to put it on or when they want to put it on. These things on here that I've, I've showed you, those are, those are direct copies from kind of their policy around this vulnerability disclosure on this platform. And they, it is, is a benefit based on this. Uh, document that not providing the vulnerability details is that both external attackers and internal personnel threats don't have access to that. Could put the, could put the uh, enterprise at undue risk. So you and I know this as security by obscurity, right? I mean, that's basically what that is, right? Lots of, lots of vendors and, and people have tried this over the years and done this differing degrees of, of success. So that's reason one. A second reason is um, is summed up in this slide. And so this is a picture of the Ferrari that DEF CON bought me for being a speaker. Thank you. Um, and I think that mainframes treat, or, uh, businesses treat their mainframes much like this Ferrari. This is a million and a half dollar Ferrari. The guy that owns it, the, the person who owns this Ferrari is not taking it out and, uh, you know, pulling a trailer with it. And they're not bringing it home and practicing their shade tree mechanic skills on it and cutting their teeth on it. They're not taking the engine apart and saying, like, how does this thing work, right? Neither is the enterprise that owns the mainframe doing this stuff because this is their pride and joy, right? And not only their pride and joy, but this runs their most critical workloads. Most enterprises that run mainframes, if you pull the mainframe out, they don't do whatever their core functionality is much well or at all. So, who am I? And why am I here? Um, basically, I'm here as kind of a call to arms. Uh, I want to get people, I got excited about this because I felt a need. I felt it was a place we could make a difference, not just breaking something, but making it better. Um, and I, I want to I want to do a call to arms to the uh, people out there that are uh, own pen testing companies or enterprises that own mainframes and say, hey, you can afford to have a mainframe and if you rely on it, you ought to have a group of people that are smart enough to pen test it, like really pen test it. Not just port scan it, not just go through and make sure everything's configured the best way possible, but the kind of pen testing that we've come to love and expect for every other platform that we have, right? Full on fuzzing, vulnerability discovery, this kind of stuff. And if you're a pen testing company and you do engagements for companies that have mainframes, you ought to be, have somebody on your staff that knows how to do this. You ought to go out and hire them. I tell you what, there are not a lot of people out there that do this. Not very many at all, as a matter of fact, but you can train them. It's very, it's very, very, very much a trainable skill. And you ought to be talking to those engagements that you have about, hey, maybe the mainframe's out of scope, but should it really be out of scope? I mean, here's some examples of why maybe this should be in scope. And you try to make it a little bit, a little bit better ecosystem. So I grew up, I've been doing computers since I was old enough to type. I like solving problems, I like not taking no for an answer, this kind of stuff. Mostly I grew up though, just by way of my background, is Linux and Windows. Uh, I started doing mainframe like maybe 10 years ago, but only really in earnest like maybe a year and a half, two years ago. So that's a little bit about me. I'll let Phil tell you a little bit about himself. Uh, thanks, Chad. So my name is uh, Phil, or you may know me as Soldier of Fortran. I run a couple of blogs about mainframe security. Uh, I really got interested in this stuff maybe handful of years ago working at a company. Um, it wasn't until I got really my own mainframe that I started sort of messing around with it. Um, I probably connected to some mainframes when I was messing around on X25 networks back in my teens. But, uh, but basically I got my own, started just doing things with it and saying, well, it's maybe not as good as people have said. There, thank you. Yeah, there you go. So, so I've got my own mainframe, did my own stuff, released a couple of tools. I spoke at DEF CON last year did all that kind of stuff. Now, I want you guys to think, so, so we sort of touched on this a little bit, but when people think mainframe, because it happened right before our talk, this is what they think of. <laughs> all right? 
you can't see that, that is a dinosaur with a payphone in its stomach. All right? That's like two dead things. And that's what people think a mainframe is when we're talking about them. Okay? But the reality is, it's about 90% of Fortune 100s are running these things. Anything that matters to you. Okay, let me do a quick poll. Who here has used a credit card in like the last 48 hours? All right, all right. Who here has used cash in the last 48 hours? Yeah, okay. So everybody, right? Anytime you did that transaction, a mainframe was involved at some point. So I'm going to show you this slide. Can't read it. Somewhere on this slide is a company you give a shit about. Okay? Also on this slide. I could have kept going with multiple slides. Okay? There's banks in here, there's airlines in here, 911, states, all kinds of things that matter to you, to everybody, are on here. They're on this platform. So if you don't think you need to care about this, you definitely need to care about this platform. Okay? The whole reason I started talking about this is because no one else was. So the rest of this talk is going to be broken down into two parts. I'm going to be talking about networking and a little bit about the tools and pen testing tools I'm releasing. And then Chad's going to talk about uh, exploit development, shell code development on the platform. So on network, when you think about it, the mainframe, you're usually thinking about a screen that looks like this. This is a classic TN3270 green screen. It's horrible to write in. This, when you write this, when you develop for this, it's written in assembly to make it look like this. This took a lot of work to set up. But you can sort of see on the screen here, if I type kicks, it'll take me to kicks. If I type TSO, it'll take me to TSO. Those are those macros. But anyways, it's TN3270. It's based on Telnet. Yes, that Telnet. It's not really Telnet because it's not really an interactive protocol. It's got these beautiful colors. But what happens is you submit, you, you get a text full of stuff, you type in whatever, you hit enter, and then it processes what you did and then sends it back to you. So you, it's not really happening in real time. Now, it's a buffer. So that whole screen you saw a couple of slides ago, it's a buffer that's 1,920 bytes long and it wraps at the 80th column every single time, right? Each byte is either going to be a character, li like you saw, or it could be a field identifying, that is an attribute that identifies it as the next character is going to be this color, or the next character is going to be locked or unlocked, or the next thousand characters are going to be locked or unlocked. And then it's going to say, are these characters visible or invisible? So on this screen, the only area you can actually touch and change is that little tiny square there, right? So when you type in and you log in, that's the only place you can type stuff on that screen. Now when I started doing this, I just used the free tools that were available to me personally. And Nmap, not so great, all right? In fact, one time I did a scan a couple years ago and it identified a bunch of mainframes as Microsoft IIS SSL. So way off mark. So I wrote my own Nmap script to take care of this. This is what it looks like before. Now the problem with this, one, it tells you that the service is Telnet. While technically true, it's not really, it's TN3270. The other challenge is IBM OS 390 is 20 years old and was discontinued 20 years ago. Like it's, it's gone. No one uses it anymore. But for some reason that's the version, and that's not even the version, it's not like a daemon that's running. That's not what it looks like. So what I did is I wrote an Nmap script to help you actually tell that you've connected to TN3270. So now, and it'll actually tell you if you're doing SSL or not. So now when you're doing a scan of your networks and you're finding mainframes, you'll actually know you're finding mainframes. But that wasn't really enough, right? That just tells me it's TN. I want the banners. I want more information. I wanted to see this. This is a real mainframe that's on the internet, okay? But I don't want to have to run an emulator every time I want to see these screens. So I wrote my own TN3270 library for Nmap in Lua. It was rough, really hard to do, but it's available and it takes things like this. This is what the banner now looks like when you do a scan against a mainframe with these two scripts. It'll show you the, that it's a TN3270 and then it'll show you the actual screen or banner that it has. So that's fun. But now, because I wrote a fully functional 3270 emulator for Nmap, I can do all kinds of cool stuff. 
This is a Kix transaction ID enumerator. Anybody know what Kix transactions are? Okay, good. So you know why this is cool. So this will go through and enumerate Kix transactions on a mainframe. Multi threaded. This is on our test mainframe. We actually have one. This is only allowing 22 threads at the same time because we only allow 22 TCP connections, but that's exactly what it looks like and it works fast. But now we can do all kinds of cool stuff with the other things that I know you can enumerate. So, VTAM application IDs, which means nothing to almost everybody here except for one person. I'm guaranteed. The other thing, oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Keep going. Why are you stopping? Oh, I'm, I want to see him take a shot. Keep going. <laughs> oh, damn. I also am going these, to. Are these you? Anyways. VTAM macros, you saw me type like TSO kicks on the first thing. Well, you don't have to actually display those items. You can just, you can just type in whatever you want and if it's a macro, it'll work. So I wrote another one that does macro enumeration. Now you guys remember when I said it was hidden and protected. Well that hidden and protection happens on the client side. So what happens when you do sort of security type stuff on the client side? You just ignore, yeah, it's not security, right? So take a look at this. This is what a Kix transaction actually looks like. And when you look at it, it's got a locked field. No, keep going. Keep going, all right. Right here. This is eight bytes long. <laughs> you all right? Yeah. What happens if you ignore that? What happens if you ignore the eight bytes of length? What happens? And you just, <laughs> I don't know. I personally actually don't know because we've never done it, but I assume the, all the apps break. The green screen becomes blue. No, it probably does. I mean, I don't know. But also, what if you have hidden fields down here? Yeah. All right, you guys know how this works. So, um, are these guys doing a good job? Yeah. All right, that's pretty good applause there. So, new speakers, hard to get here. Congratulations. Here's DEF CON. And now let's find out what happens to the kicks field. Yes, thanks. Thanks for making it sound so exciting. <laughs> but no lie, if you actually do care about this stuff, and you all should, trust me, this is some crazy shit. So, oh, that's a stupid thing. That's hard to do if you need to go and identify all the hidden fields by yourself. This emulator ignores all the rules. In the Nmap emulator, it just ignores them. It doesn't care if it's hidden. It'll show you. If it's not modifiable, it doesn't care. It'll just keep putting characters in there. So you can do things like this and automate finding hidden characters in green screen applications on the mainframe. Also, you can just do fuzzing now. You can just use this to fuzz mainframe applications, which was not a thing you could do before. But I wrote one in Lua. Why not also do one in Python? Same as Nmap. It's same thing. But now I can do a script that I wrote called set n3270. If you don't give it any arguments, it just creates a fake TSO login screen to trick you, you know, you trick users into hitting it, they're going to put in their user credentials. It can mirror a target mainframe so you connect, it does a bunch of stuff, and it will also do proxy ma man in the middle, and it will also do SSL. So if you have an SSL mainframe, it will just, because the clients don't really care. So this is what it looks like. This I'm just going to show you the default mode here. So here it's going to run. That's why I record my demos. They never work when I do them live. And I'm going to launch my 3270 emulator. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Somebody got it, so at least. So this is a fake TN3270 TN3 TSO login screen. This is what everybody uses when they log on to the mainframe for the most part. I'm going to log in as Dade, give it a password. When I hit enter, it's going to show up in the bottom. And it's going to kick the user off and say, actually, we shut this mainframe down. You can't use it anymore. Now, there's other tools out there. So, Dominic White, are you here? Put your hand up if you're here. All righty. So, he's actually given a talk at DerbyCon. I recommend you see it. It's a great talk. Uh, he also has some tools, uh, big iron reconnaissance and ponage. Once you see hidden fields, once you see all that thing and you want to manipulate them, you can use his tool to do it. And then there's also Mainframe Brute. Which is a tool he wrote, which was based on a tool I wrote, so I don't know who owes who what kudos, but. All right, so that's TN3270. You probably have heard of it if you work around mainframes, right? This is something most people have never heard of, 
because no one talks about it, but it's called network job entry. I heard about it maybe a mm, handful of years ago when I was doing a walkthrough of a mainframe and someone told me they were, they were working on a dev system not connected to any other system and they submit a job and it created a user in the production environment. And I was like, what the hell is this? How is this possible? And he just nonchalantly like, oh, just, it's just NJE. I'm like, I have never, nowhere in any security guide, in any book, nowhere does it talk about network job entry. But that's what this is. Basically, two mainframes share a, he share a uh, secret handshake and after they've had that handshake, they are trusted nodes and they can send jobs and command and control messages between them. And they don't send passwords, they don't send anything. So it kind of works like this. This is an actual configuration from our mainframe. And so my, this is my mainframe. I'm going to say I have two nodes. My node name is New York. Chad's node name is Washington DC. And this is the IP address I need to connect to when I'm connecting to his mainframe. Now he would do the exact opposite on his mainframe. He would switch New York and watch DC and then change the IP address. It runs on port 175 or 2252. It uses host names. So those, those, those nodes, which they call nodes in the configuration file, but they call host names in the documentation. I don't know why. It runs over TCP IP, so that's good. And it was developed in the 80s, we think? Because it's not really clear. There's a couple of ways you can break this. But first I need to identify that it's even running. This is what happens when you do nmap against an NJE port. It has no idea what it's talking about. So I wrote another nmap script which will tell us that we're connected to an NJE port on a mainframe and that it's open, accepting connections. The next thing we need is the actual host name. So what happens when they share that secret handshake is the mainframe says, I'm New York, you're Washington DC, I want to connect to you. And the mainframe says, that name checks out, my name checks out, we're going to connect. And if you add a password, which you should because if you add a password to this it breaks everything I'm going to talk about next, so do that. But the default is not to have a password. Yeah. So basically, if you say I'm New York and you're Cincinnati, does not allow you to connect. So we can use that to brute force the node names ourselves. So I wrote another, and I think this might be the last nmap script. I wrote another nmap script to brute force that. So now we've got the node names for this system. We've got the node name for the other system. Now if, there's an easier way. If you just steal the configuration file from one of the mainframes, you'll have them all anyways, right? Because they have, all have to declare them all at the same time. So we got the host name, we got the IP address. What I did was write an NJE library in Python in order a program called Injector. What Injector does is given an IP address and the two host names and you can actually pass it a password here and a command you want to execute, it will connect to the mainframe and execute that command as the other mainframe. This is called, so I'm just running a JES2 command here, that's about all you can run. But that's about what that looks like. Right? So that's amazing. That's terrifying. So put a password on it, please. Now, that's the end of that stuff. And one of the fun things when we, when we do this research is we encounter a lot of old guides that we have to use. So all that stuff for NJE, and nothing special. I just read a couple of books that IBM has put out and wrote my tools. It's not, it's not impossible to do. So we use a lot of books in our research and we use a lot of stuff. So I, don't, I want everyone's hands to go up. Everybody. All your hands. Everybody. Now, if you were born, here Chad, help me out because I would screw this up. If this book is older than you are, I want your hand to go down, okay? So this first one, 1992. Okay, a couple of hands went down, okay. 1988. Okay, a couple of hands went down. 1978, oh, whoa, <laughs> okay, still got some hands up, still got some hands up, good, good. 1964? That's the right. Oh, a oh, couple of people still left. That's it. We have nothing older than that. So you can put your hands down. <laughs> I'm going to get Chad back up here. He's going to explain what this book meant and continue from there. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, I was actually looking up uh, an assemb a mainframe assembler construct. I was Googling it 
and uh, the exact specification that I wanted came up in that PDF only. So the instruction I was looking for and, th and the way it works was in that document, which if you read the small print, was printed in like on you know, one of those big wide like green bar printers, the tractor feed, and then somebody took the time to scan it and put it on the internet. So um, I'm going to talk about exploit development. And basically, did that go blank? It's the wrong button. All right. So I'll talk about ex exploit development for a second. And basically what I'm going to talk about is um, when I talked, when I had this conversation with Phil and wanted to know about, you know, who's doing the vulnerability scanning, anybody write exploits, buffer overflows, he said no, not that he knew of. And I, I did a lot of Googling, couldn't find anything. And then there's this kind of like, you know, mass herd knowledge of like, well, it's not even, it's not even really possible. So I hear statements like that and I'm probably like a lot of you and I hear something like, it's not possible. I'm like, fuck, yeah, okay. I haven't met me yet, right? I, you know, I like the rest of you. So, so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this a shot. But here's the deal: I can't mainframe. I spent a lot of time on mainframes, but I've never really gotten into this level of mainframe, right? So I don't know. I'm like, I don't know JCL. I don't know what PL, what PL1 is or Rex or Cobol. And I just heard about 3270 and NJE from Phil's talk right now. So I have no idea what I'm doing, basically. But what I do know is, and, and some of you probably fall into this category, but what I do know is the mainframe is an amazing machine, runs all kinds of stuff, and most of the stuff that it runs are probably things that you know, probably know better than I, better than I do. So some little known technologies like this. So what you're seeing here are all different types of technologies, right, that run on a mainframe. And there's at least one, if not more, of these on here that probably everybody in this room is some kind of expert at. So I said, good, well, I'm not going to start with all these things that I don't really understand. I'm going to start with one of the ones I do understand. So I start, so <clears throat> first things first is I had to learn about the architecture. First question I get when, some, when I tell somebody we're talking about it, I say, well, what, what CPU is that? It's its own CPU. It's a Z architecture. It is a proprietary CPU that doesn't exist anywhere else. It's not Intel. It's not ARM. It's its own thing. So just to give you an example, this is a very, 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 very brief but illustrative uh, points about what's different about it. So the programs can run in one in three modes, right? 23, 31, or 64-bit modes. There's three sets of registers, 48 registers on the CPU. It's big endian. There's three types of memory addressing. There's absolute memory, real memory, and virtual memory. It is a von Neumann architecture. So those of you know that know what that means, basically that you can store data and you can store instructions kind of in the same memory space and the CPU doesn't care, right? It just bites. It's what allows us to do pretty much like the core of exploits, buffer overflows, that kind of stuff. It's why that works. It's why it doesn't work well on like microcontrollers or Harvard architectures. It's kind of a wholly different beast. It's kind of stack based. There's, there's, there's kind of a concept of stack. And it has some things that you don't find on other systems. So like this idea of memory key protection. So every 4K block of memory has a few bits that are the protection key on that memory. Every instruction that gets executed also has a protection key. When the, when the, when the CPU goes out and tries to fetch the memory, tries to write the memory, it compares these keys. If a certain value is yielded on that comparison, it lets the fetch or write or both happen. If not, it doesn't. It sets an invalid storage access and that's it. Shuts you down right there. So that's at the CPU level. So processes that get the, their address space can't write or read outside of those address spaces unless they have authority to do it. That's a very different construct than what you see in a lot of stuff. So where to start? This is a massive system and it has tremendous numbers of differing technologies on it. So like I said earlier, I was kind of at the time focusing on reverse engineering, buffer overflow, shell code, that kind of stuff. I said, hey, it runs Unix. Unix is like one of the main faces of the mainframe. There's the traditional MVS, some of the stuff that Phil was showing, and there's Unix system services, which is basically just like another window into the mainframe. But it's POSIX compliant, looks a lot like AIX. If you know Linux, you can easily pick this up, or if you have just done Unix, it's very much Unix. Uh, and C, it, it compiles C, it compiles C++. But, you know, based on C, uh, where all good um, exploits begin their, uh, their lives, I thought, well, I'll just start with C and I'll start with Unix. It also has an assembly language that is entirely different from, uh, from the Intel assembly language, different set of mnemonics. There are thousands of instructions. Uh, it's a CISC based processor. The C stands for complex. Uh, just, just as an example, there are, there are 26 different possible instruction formats for every instruction. 
Uh, so you can have register to immediate, register to register, register to memory, memory to memory, that sort of thing. Uh, in all the different bit modes, right? You have 23, 31, 64 bit. So, so as an example, like an add instruction, like a basic add instruction, there's 15 different kinds of add instructions. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, options out there for assembly. So I'm going to, I set a very, very, very uh, narrow goal for this. And that was like, what I really want to have is I want to have, I want to write a vulnerable, vulnerable program, plausible vulnerable program. I want to write some shell code that pops a shell and I want to, I want to deliver that. Sort of like the hello world of, of shell coding, exploit development, buffer overflows. And so the first thing I have to find out is can I actually execute strings as code, right? This is the basis of all uh, good overflows. Like, so I've got a buffer there that SC, which is basically a bunch of hex bytes that represent valid mainframe instructions. And if you do shell coding or exploit development, you'll recognize this stub. It's a very common C stub to test shell code. Uh, which all it does is really create a, uh, a function pointer to this string. Uh, if the string is valid instructions and the CPU allows me to do this, this should work. And it did. So here it, it runs through, but I'll just skip to the end and show you. Uh, what you got here right at the top there where it says dead beef, so the two instructions that I created basically just take, clear out a register, take the dead beef hex string, put it in the register. So those bytes right there that say like C01 dead beef and right below it where it's 07FE, those are the strings that I had in my buffer. So this is a big deal. Can I execute strings as code? Yes, I can. I called Phil up. I was like, Phil, I can execute strings as code. I'm so excited. This is like May of this year, like this May. I was like, well, this is great. This is like part way to the thing that we were talking about. So the next thing is like that's great but this is obviously very staged. If you write a program like that <laughs> and it works, great. But really you haven't done anything. Um, so the next thing is like, well, can we overflow this buffer and can we do it in a meaningful way, right? So worst case scenario is I get a denial of service. I can overflow the buffer and maybe it crashes. Best case scenario is I can overflow the buffer and maybe it lands something in some special register that I can control and then all the good stuff happens. So this is the, this is the, uh, the sample program that I, that I'm going to be using for the rest of the demonstrations. It's very simple. It's obviously vulnerable. It uses a get string without any bounce checking. Um, but there's a, been a million and one different types of, uh, exploits over the years that this very thing is at the core of, right? This is, this is, this is how it starts. So I take this, I take this code and I compile it. I'm going to run it in my, uh, debugger. I say a word about the debugger for just a second. So this, I don't know if you can see it up there, but this is a DBX debugger. So this is a debugger that comes with the mainframe on Unix system services. It is a little bit analogous to GDB. So I tell people when they ask me about this, I say, hey, if you love GDB and you know how to work in GDB, because those of us who do kind of like it, then you will probably not like this or maybe hate it. <laughs> it's, it's very GDB-like, but it's just like enough to kind of make you angry about it. Like it's got, it's got instructions that he's like, oh, yeah, I can do that GBI. No, no. To, to, to kind of further make you angry, angry about it, um, DBX is a debugger that Oracle ships with some of its products. This is not the same debugger, but it has some of the same instructions. So if you're Googling this and you're looking for like, you know, something like, hey, how can I uh, go in and edit memory? What do I have to do to do that? And you find it on an Oracle site and says, you enter this switch and this command, it's like, ah, oh, great, you can go in. No, that one's not implemented. You, you can't do that one. But it is enough. It is enough, as I showed here. This is all I used. I, my goal with this was only to use tools that were actually on the mainframe. So I didn't write anything for it. I didn't port anything to it. I used the ones that, that come with it. This is very simple. I had no magic here. I just had a buffer that said hello world and I catted it to this and I ran it in there. And then on the bottom, that bottom green box there, basically I can see where my string is stored in memory and I can start looking at the interesting bytes that come after it and say, hey, is there anything that's interesting there? And there are interesting things there. Um, and oh, by the way, just because I haven't mentioned it yet, so in a different to, in addition to uh, a different compiler, different operating system, different CPU, different instruction set, different debugger, it also, everything's in EBSDIC. It's a different character set. It's not ASCII, right? So at the end of this, we're not going to get a 41, 41, 41, 41 in EIP, right? It's going to be a C1, C1. But yeah, so, so if you do any, anything you take between an Intel system and this, there has to be that ASCII to EBCDIC conversion. It's a whole different code page. So this, taking that research further, 
the next step, what you do when you're building this kind of stuff, it's like, okay, there's a valid buffer, let's start sending it some extra characters and overflow it and see what happens. Like, this is usually where the magic happens. And this was the next major milestone. I was like, if this works, great. If it doesn't, this will be like a, like a five minute DEF CON hallway talk, right? Probably wouldn't get a free shot either. So what happened? Lots of crashing. And since this debugger is really designed for people who are building programs, not people who are, you know, de decompiling or uh, disassembling programs, it failed and it failed in a way that was like really helpful because I got a lot of these DDPI DLE XFS X for bad 134 messages. Just super helpful. What's below that though is storage access failed. So if you remember when I was talking about memory key protection, storage ac access failed saying to me, you tried to access something from a, from a memory that, that your process doesn't have. It might not be a valid memory address, but it doesn't matter because you don't have access to it. I'm not going to tell you if it's valid or not valid. I'm just going to tell you you can't have it. What I found out later is that I was actually overwriting what, what would be kind of analogous to a base pointer, but there was nothing here when the program crashed that I could find that out. So I did some more digging and I went back to the manuals and, and, if, and, and when all of you start to get into mainframes, like I know all of you will because I can tell, I can see it, uh, anytime you research something, you have a f about five manuals open that are about a thousand pages each. I'm not exaggerating at all because you want to find out like something very simple but you have to read three different manuals. You have a configuration manual, you have a reference manual, you have a user's guide and you have like maybe a setup manual and then maybe a red book, right? And it takes all of them to find out something easier because they're, not because they're a, obtuse because they're so comprehensive. They're so comprehensive that if you want to do something simple, it, 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 it's never easy. So I went back and I started reading about like, well, how are, how's the function call work? So you, you think of the Intel world, like how's the, how's the, uh, the frame, the stack frame set up, right? Does the caller set it up? Does the call E set it up? Who manages the base pointer? Who manages the stack pointer, right? If you do this kind of work, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, just, just nod your head. Um, like who does that, right? And, and where is it? Because it's a very standard calling convention. So I did a little research on that and then I went back to my proof of concept and I figured out that what I needed to do was take one of these things I was overwriting and instead of overwriting that part of it, I needed to actually send that back through and then I could keep on writing. So it's kind of, it's not meant to be, but it kind of works like a stack canary, right? Like a stack canary. So if you compile a program on a Linux system that has stack canaries enabled and you do a buffer overflow and overwrite that canary, what happens, right? Program crashes and says, hey, you modified your memory, can't go on. But if you are able to put that very canary back in the right exact spot, then you can continue exploiting that program just like you would if it wasn't there. So I did. And what happened next, beside the screen going dark, was, there we go, uh, was, lo and behold, uh, I was able to not only continue execution, but I had the, the program crashed, but it crashed awesome. So if you look at this, at the top there, those C1s are A's, C2s are B's, so on and so forth, the, there's my base pointer. So if I took this buffer and I put it in that memory, I got one of these. So the, 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 for those of you who do this out there, you know what this means, right? This is my instruction pointer with a bunch of ASCII text or EBCDIC text in it. Uh, those are C's, right? So that's outstanding. I put that there, right? I made the computer now go to where it thinks the next instruction should be because of something that I just passed it as a string. So I called Philip. And Phil, 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 like you gotta believe this. Like I gotta send this out. Like I'm gonna tweet this and like the six people in the world who know what this means are gonna be so excited. <laughs> and Phil was really excited. He's like, that's great, that's great. Now go back and finish it. I was like, okay. So this is like the end of June. By now we've been accepted our DEF CON talk. And I would have been content, like that, that's pretty good right there. Like you know what that means, it's pretty good. But I'm not, I'm not happy taking that as like, you know, the end of this. So the next thing is I gotta build a working, I gotta build some shell code, right? I need something that actually does something. So back to the drawing board, learn myself some uh, assembly. I started doing it in C, but as you know, when you compile it, the compiler does all kinds of unholy things to your code, moves stuff around, and that doesn't work really well for shell code. You want relative addresses, relative jumps, you want, maybe you want to control the nulls or that kind of stuff. So I, so I wrote it all in assembly. The assembly here is very similar to when you write assembly on an Intel platform, uh, different mnemonics, but the same ideas about how things work. You've got your, setting up your frame, find your exact function, that bit right there, that red, that red arrow, that's important. So the mainframe has, an, has something called you, uh, assembler callable services. 
So this is like in Linux where you can do a syscall, right? You can get exec or some of those things that are like so ubiquitous that every process has access to them. You just got to find them in memory, right? And uh, Windows had it too, has it too, like the WS32, like some of those things are in, they're part of every process. You can find them, like you want to open a port, you want to listen, you want to bind, that kind of stuff. It has it too. So I'm going to exec and I'm going to pass it a string that is area in the constant section that has been sh. All right? So this is no shocker. Like I, I, once I got this working, I got it to run, you can see I created, uh, you know, this, this is no magic here. This is just me being able to actually write a program that runs. So my program at the end writes shell and it launches a shell. Outstanding. So, and it, the steps are the same as, as those steps that you would use on any other platform. You assemble, link, execute. All right. So we got it, we got a working shell. Now we got to convert it to shell code uh, and see if that works. So I was able to take the debugger again and it does have a couple of decent features in it. But when you create shell code, you basically are cutting out that portion of the binary that actually does the stuff, right? You're not worrying about setting things up. You're not worrying about tearing things down. You just want that part of the binary that does the stuff. And the stuff in this case is like launching the shell. That's all I want. I don't care about any of the, uh, the forward. I don't care about any of the cleanup. I just want the stuff. So back in the debugger, I'm able to get the offsets that I want. So there's my first instruction. There's my last instruction. I'm going to get those offsets and the length of the shell code. I'll print it out. There's some idea of what it will look like when I format it. And now I need to format it into a string that I can use in C or into assembly. So I wrote a little, uh, I wrote a little uh, a Python script that you can basically just pass your binary to, pass the beginning offset, pass the length, and it will kick you out some super nice formatted shell code that you can just drop into C. We'll also kick out assembly code if you want to drop it into your assembly on the mainframe. And it will, if you want it to, create encoded code. So if you're going to pass uh, shell code as a string, it can't have any nulls, it can't have any new lines in it. So this, this simple little Python script will go through, find a, a valid character, XOR everything, and give you a good, uh, give you a good string with no nulls and no new lines. So that's great. So the next thing was test this out. So I took the, I took the shell code, put it back in the same buffer, execute the program, and now I know, and not only can I exer, not, not only can I execute strings as instructions, but I can do something that actually matters, right? I, can, I got a shell now from nothing but shell code. And the last thing I'm going to do with it is what I was just talking about, which encode it and remove the bad character. So if you guys use, you know, Metasploit or whatever, use MSF encode or MS payload or MS venom or whatever, does this for you. This is doing it by hand. I wrote a script to do it because none of that stuff exists. Um, by the way, the Python that I'm talking about is Python on the mainframe. So you can run Python on the mainframe, which is a godsend. That did help a great deal in a lot of this, automating a lot of this stuff. So there I just generated the same buffer, but I did it in assembly and it was, a, it was the encoded version. So it doesn't have any nulls, doesn't have any new lines in it. Put it in this program, which is a stub program that goes through and decodes it and then jumps to it. This is how a lot of exploits, malware, that kind of stuff works, right? There's a tiny little header that's a decoder or an, or an encoder or an encryptor. It, it maybe decodes or decrypts the payload and then it jumps to it and executes. So it's like one stage, two stage. That's exactly what's here. I'm going to take that now, tested it, compiled it, works great, convert that into shell code. Now I've got my final shell code, right? So this is what I'm going to take. I'm going to package it all together with the offsets. I'm going to build a, a Python delivery vehicle that kind of concatenates everything. I'm going to pipe it in. We're going to see what happens. It's exciting. I don't know what's going to happen. So this is the same vulnerable echo program that I had before, just a little bit bigger buffer, so I have a little room to move. The shell code ended up being like, 450 bytes, which isn't too bad for, for, for popping a shell. I think I could have made it a little bit smaller, but 450 bytes is pretty reasonable. This is the, this is just the high level of the Python script right here. So if you return address that I've mentioned before that has to be there. And oh, by the way, that address was the same every time. Just gonna let that sink in for a second, okay? I mean, through, I, through reboots on different systems, okay? The jump address of my buffer, where the, where the buffer gets stored in memory, a few other filler variables. There's the same shell code. I'm going to put it all together, pipe it out to uh, standard output. I'll see what happens. So 
This is just the, pr the program being executed to show that it works. Right. So take a string through standard input, kick it back to you. Now what I did in this, what I did with this is instead of, I, I, I took the echo binary and I made it a suid binary, right? So there's a, con there's a concept of suids. I made it a suid binary, I made it owned by IBM user, which is like the root user, the zero ID zero user, to see if not only could I execute it, but could I inherit those permissions, authorities as well. So what happens here, I'll blow it up just a little bit. So first we've got my restricted user, my restricted employee who doesn't have access to anything, he can't SU, he can't cat our super secret file because it's only owned and readable by, by, the, root, by the root user. They'll run this on the command line and now we can SU, we can cat that file and we're root. So from start to finish, success. So I think that was, I think that was like a three hour call to Phil. I'm like, Phil, you're not going to believe this. You're going to print this out, you're going to put it on your fridge and tell your friends about it. I'm, cause I'm sure they care. Uh, like this, this is exciting. So this opened a whole number of doors. Um, because we know that a lot of the traditional things that we know how to do work here. And what we're up here doing is making it, is trying to make it so that, that those of you who want to get involved in this or those of you who own companies want to hire people and get involved in it or have companies and want to get people involved in it don't have to do quite the learning curve. We don't need to maybe make you a mainframe expert to do this kind of stuff. You don't have to spend the, the nine months getting up to speed like, like I did on this because I'm releasing, you know, tools and how-tos and facts and that kind of stuff on my blog to get you the answers faster so you don't have to do that kind of research. So what's next? We got a huge pool of stuff. We were just talking over lunch like we added like 30 more things to the list of what might happen next, right? Things like MSF in integration, what we really need is a custom debugger slash disassembler which I'm working on. If any of you have worked with like the radar, uh, uh, framework that is on my short list of making work on this system. Uh, more privilege escalations, different kinds of deployment modules and that sort of stuff. If we've piqued your interest, uh, we have started a mailing list of which there are now two members, right? Because Phil, you signed up? Yep. Okay, so there's both of us on there. Uh, but honestly, it's like, it's a public mailing list. Anybody can sign up. I encourage you to sign up. They, well, you can ask questions. You can ask them anonymously. Not, there are mailing lists like this, but they're all associated with the company. This one's not. So everybody should sign up for it. Uh, we put all the code, the tools, the proofs of concept, the exact things that ran that made this demo are out on the GitHub right now. Um, both of our blogs, soldierfortran.org and beginningofsmalls.com have lots of good information. We'll continue to have lots of good information as we go down this journey. But what we really need is you guys to add to the body of knowledge. So with that, I just want to say thanks to DEF CON. Let us talk about this. Thanks for IBM for having this cool platform because it really is a hoot and we are really enjoying it. Thanks again to Dominic uh, for the work that you've done and everybody else really who's kind of allowed this to happen because it, it needs to happen and we're having a ball with it. So there's our contact info. I appreciate it. I know we're out of time but we'll be around if you guys have any questions or you can absolutely contact us, talk about it because We'll talk about it forever, so be, be, be warned, all right? But thank you very much. Thanks for everybody who came and showed up. Really appreciate it.